Good evening. How many times have we heard that phrase? Uh, or he died peacefully in his sleep. Or she opened her eyes, smiled to see it was me holding her hand, then closed her eyes and quietly breathed her last. Those of us who have stood vigil at a loved one's deathbed wonder how often these scenes actually occur. The last moments of one's life can be harrowing, but the last few months and years can also be a time of anguish and fear, particularly for those of advanced age. As an individual's quality of life declines and one's independence slowly melts away, the fear of losing complete control and becoming a burden to others is very real. Many these days are not about to put up with it. Suicide, assisted suicide, dirty words, words, words difficult for people to come to terms with, words whispered, like the Dracula-like image of Jack Kevorkian invading our minds. We are live at JFK Middle School in Northampton. I'm WHMP's Bob Flaherty, along with Denise Vozella and Bill Newman, as we, along with the Daily Hampshire Gazette and Northampton Cable TV, present A Matter of Life and Death, a community forum exploring the care we provide for our elders as they approach the end of life. Is there such a thing as a good death? If so, what is the role of family members? Do we intervene, attempt to hijack the rights of the loved one involved? Do we back off and allow matters to take their own course? Or do we offer assistance? We'll also explore whether elders are getting the care they need as life nears its end. And are they privy to the range of options available? Is assisted suicide one of those options? And is it possible to have a reasoned conversation around it? Tonight, we're going to give it a try. Our panelists, Ann Latham of West Hampton, whose 90-year-old parents killed themselves. Laurie Loisel, the Daily Hampshire Gazette's managing editor, whose family elected to go public with the cause of death when her father killed himself. Author Nell Lake of the book, The Caregivers, a support group stories of slow loss and courage. Dr. Joan Burzoff, director of the End of Life Certificate Program at the Smith College School for Social Work and Bay State Medical Center. And 90-year-old Lee Hawkins of Northampton, who speaks unabashedly about ending her life in the very near future. To audience members, if you have a question or a comment, step right up to the mic. You can even pass us a note, like the, the old days back at school. Uh, to those watching at home, to those listening at home, you can call our producer, Joan Holliday, at 586-7140, and she will text us with any question that you might have. The uh, matter of life and death, will be broadcast tomorrow morning from 8 to 10 a.m. on WHMP 96.9 FM, 1400 and 1600 a.m. So to get us started, WHMP's news director, Denise Vozella. Good evening, everyone. What a wonderful crowd. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Uh, I wanted to start with Lori Loisel because really you were the impetus for this, a conversation between Bob and you after he read the article that you had written in the Gazette about the death of your father. And if you could briefly recount for us the story of your father's suicide and tell us that if you believe if assisted suicide was legal in Massachusetts, which it is not, uh, do you believe that he would have chosen a different method of death, a different path? Well, <coughs> he um, actually he lived in Maine, so it wouldn't have mattered about Massachusetts, but uh, he was 83, fairly healthy, not depressed, but he didn't like what he saw happening to the elderly people around him in the elderly um, apartment complex he lived in. And he told us that he had a plan um, to go to a police station and shoot himself with a gun because he felt like at a police station, people would be prepared to deal with it. We, my siblings and I gathered with him and, and spent a weekend with him actually and tried to talk to him about other things that we could put in his life to make him feel better about aging. Um, we thought we had succeeded in that, convincing him that maybe this wasn't the time he, and, or the method. Um, but that night after we all had dinner, he 
did exactly what he said he was going to do. And, um, and I have to say, it's, I do 100% believe it was his right to do it, but it seemed barbaric to me that somebody would have to take that action. And I, if there was assisted suicide, I don't think it would have helped him because he wasn't, he didn't have, you have to have a diagnosis um, beyond being old. And um, so, but I just feel like as a culture, we need to talk more about how to prepare for the last years of life, not just the last month of life or the last six months of life, like how to help people feel better as they lose some autonomy and independence. Um, so, Looking just, back as, as the child of someone who chose to, to take his own life, because as you've described it, the fear of what might have happened, he wasn't sick. Um, uh, is there anything that you feel that you would have, could have done differently? Uh, I don't actually think there was anything I could have done differently. I mean, I, we had the most frank conversations. Um, and I wouldn't have hospitalized him if I knew he was going to do it that night anyway. I mean, just he's 83. He's entitled to do what he feels he needs to do. But, but I feel like sort of, what I feel like is something needed to happen sooner than that moment it, it, across society. Like, I feel like we're sort of not spending enough time with this part of people's life because we make old people invisible. And it just feels like they, they lose their um, agency, and it just seems, mm -hmm. it seems like what he did was lonely and barbaric, you know, to himself and everybody around him. Um, and I feel like, and, and I would have thought this was his particular story if I hadn't gotten so many letters and emails and calls from people who had similar stories in their families. So I know it wasn't just his idiosyncrasy. I know a lot of people have had this experience. So it seems like there's something missing in our services or the way we help people age. It's going to happen to all of us. So, uh, Ann Latham, uh, your parents made a pact to end their lives when they thought they would no longer be able to live in their big farmhouse. Uh, lots of people profess such things. Uh, when did you know that they really meant it? I'm not sure I ever knew they really meant it until they did it. But um, my parents were fiercely independent and like a lot of people they said they would never ever leave their house and you know never be moved into an, uh, an assisted care facility. Never wanted to be separated. They would live in their big old rambling farmhouse until it fell down around them or they fell down themselves and that was it. But they, um, they last year were, were clearly failing. My mother was in severe pain. My father was approaching 90 and, and cared for her a lot, but uh, he was definitely getting old. As my brother said the week before, he said, you know, they're dying, but of nothing in particular. And so uh, it was just about a year ago now uh, that uh, uh, I got an email that said exit in the subject line, and the email said we are checking out. And that's when I found out. Um, in every suicide, people want to know the manner of death. Uh, reporters that go out into the, the street. It's the first thing that people want to know. So can you describe how they did it? Yeah, when I uh, got out there, <laughs> they were 1,400 miles away when, when I got there. I didn't know up before him, but they, um, there was a book on my father's desk called The Peaceful Pill. And he had bookmarks in the book, and he had yellow highlights on things. He was obviously researching this very carefully. Uh, he um, had gone through the chapter on carbon monoxide, and apparently uh, the carbon monoxide from uh, a running car does not necessarily get to the right concentration levels fast enough. So he put um, a big old tray in the back of the car after folding down the back seats and put uh, a little charcoal grill in the back of the car, a tight Volvo, sealed it up, and he and my mother got inside, and that uh, apparently is a very quick way to go. Lee Hawkins, good evening. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here and for being so willing to share what your plans are for, for your, the end of your life. Can you tell us what it is that you're, you're planning for yourself? Well, I'm not exactly planning anything. Okay. <laughs> I am 
ready to do what needs to be done, when it needs to be done, and if it needs to be done. And I think I have to just preface this by saying that um, the idea for end of life actually hit me way back when Oregon was changing their thoughts about how they were handling things. And it was a purely intellectual thing. It had nothing to do with me at that point. But when they were contemplating how they were going to use government money to care for people, they started saying, we shouldn't make everything available to everybody and let it be just kind of a dip into the pot and choose what, who's going to get this treatment. We should really think what is cost effective and effective. What can we do that will save a lot of lives at the right time? And maybe we have to skip some of the things that are really very expensive and a little problematical. Maybe for somebody who's too old to enjoy many years of life afterward, or, uh, well, anyway, it got me to thinking. And I, as, as I say, it was kind of a social justice issue with me. And I had that in my head for a very long time. You said that you don't have any specific plans, but you have made a decision, have, have you not? Well, I, I have been in nursing homes. And I know I don't want to end up my life in a nursing home. I know that I don't want my kids to take care of me for many, many years if I drag on and on. I don't think I'd enjoy it. I don't know they wouldn't enjoy it. And they're really dear, much loved, and loving kids. But there is another life besides caring for an elder, and certainly richer lives than that. So I decided, well, how do you go about this? You know, I'm not used to thinking in terms like that. I thought, well, I'm not going to shoot myself. I'm a pacifist. I can't do that. <laughs> Then I thought, well, I know somebody in one of the homes around here hung herself. Well, it doesn't appeal to me at all, and I keep thinking of it in two directions. I think of it, I'm here, would I like that? And then I think, what is somebody going to feel if they walk in? I couldn't do that to anybody. Asphyxiation sounds a little better, get into a car and turn on the motor. But somehow, I think, no. So I decided the most gracious way to go was just to stop eating and drinking. Now, I don't know, some people say, oh, that'll be so painful. I've heard people who say, no, it's not. I've heard people who say, yes, it is. I'm human, I might start it and think, oh, I really didn't like this as much as I thought I was. Going to have to re rethink it. But whatever I'm doing, I'm bringing the family into the, th the thinking. I guess they're pretty used to it because I can remember back to Oregon days. <laughs> and it has been a comfortable conversation with the family. Once my youngest brought her boyfriend for dinner, and he said, I never ate dinner with a family before that talked about death. And I said, well, it's a lot better to talk about it now when nobody is dying than to have it come on you suddenly. So that's really where I stand right now. I'm enjoying life. I have no plans tomorrow or a week from now to do anything with my life. But I fall a lot. I can walk bad only very poorly. 
if I end up in the nursing home, you'll all know now. <laughs> you can watch and see what I do. <laughs> can bring in, uh, Dr. Joan Burzak for a minute. Um, what are the options for somebody like Lee? She's listed off the things that the only thing that she could come up with is to starve herself. What else is left here? What? Well, there is something called the Final Exit Network that has another method that has to do with helium and that has to do with um, putting something over your head. But you are found and it can be hard and not everybody would choose to die that way. I think that the way you're describing is in fact a method that many people use, which is to withdraw hydration and nutrition, which is quite apparently a peaceful way to die, um, a nonviolent way to die. Um, my own mother, who carried on about how she wanted to die until, well, she, until she finally did, um, was absolutely uh, convinced that she would end her life, and in fact didn't. And at each uh, sort of turning point, she went for more aggressive treatment um, rather than less. And when she would talk about withdrawing nutrition and hydration, she'd say, but then I couldn't eat ice cream. So <laughs> she wasn't into it in the end. But I think many people do make that choice and it's a pretty peaceful one. And again, you mentioned Oregon. Your situation, of course, would not apply in Oregon or, or anywhere else because um, that's for people with terminal illnesses um, who have only six months to live. And so, um, no matter where you were, uh, your, the situation you're describing is illegal at the moment. <laughs> and, and you also raised a social justice issue. You said it's illegal? Well, assisted suicide is not legal in this country. But if you but don't need if a you don't eat drink, you have the choice to, yes, okay. you have the choice to okay. die. Absolutely. And you mentioned it as a social justice issue, and I would agree with you. I think it is the new civil rights issue of, of our times, um, and it is a civil rights issue. It's about rights, it's about control, it's about um, being able to assert autonomy, it's being able to, again, uh, make decisions, ideally with your family, on your own behalf. Um, so I, I think you're absolutely right, it's about social justice. Can, can, a, can a family member interfere here? Can someone yes. come in and, and take away Lee's rights? Well, if someone is actively suicidal, there is the uh, potential to hospitalize that person for depression, for example. Um, I'm going to shamelessly plug my husband's book. He's writing a book about assisted suicide, and he should be up here, not me. Um, but he has a, a case of a couple who made the decision that your parents made, Anne. Um, and in fact, when uh, the male member of the couple told his physician friend what they were going to do, he had the man hospitalized for depression. So suddenly, this physician himself is now in a psychiatric hospital. Of course, he came out of the hospital and followed through with the plan, and he and his wife jointly ended their lives. So yes, um, there have been cases where indeed um, people who choose to end their lives are deemed suicidal and then psychiatrically hospitalized. Um, by the way, I know a lot of folks uh, came in here uh, late. Uh, we have a microphone right here. Um, there's not going to be a question and answer period. The whole thing is a question and answer period. So if you have a question, comment or anything, come right up. Step right up to the mic. Hi, my name is Madge McQueen, and I just want to mention that I lived for 11 years at Twin Oaks Community, and a, an elder who lived with us decided to do v, v, D, VSED, Voluntary Stopping of Eating and Drinking, and she was eight days into it, and she told, she called her son, and, her, and she had prepared very well. She'd made a video, she'd written documents, she'd talked to hospice. We knew in the community, we all knew what she was doing. And she was eight days into it. She called her son, who was actually in Hawaii. He called the sheriff's office, they came and they took her to a mental hospital and we could not stop them. This was in the state of Virginia, this was last May. So she found another way to, to take her own life many months later, and she did not tell us in advance. So it... It's real. I just want it's to mention real. that. Thank you. 
Thank you. Could I just ask one thing? I don't use the term suicide, and I certainly don't think I'm going to commit suicide. I call it planned death. I mean, suicide is something that you do in desperation, and I don't think we should be calling it that. I'd like to bring in Nell, Nell Lake, author of the book, uh, The Caregivers, a support group stories of slow loss, courage, and love. And I wanted to ask you, does it matter what we call this, assisted suicide, planned death? Do you believe that what we call it matters? I, you know, there was this a New York Times article about this recently, the difference between aid and dying. This is the new term that people, I think, some people want to use, which is aid in dying versus suicide, because um, the idea is that suicide, as Lee says, is more a, a, a symptom of mental illness or desperation. I think, to me, I see more of a continuum, in a sense, um, but I can completely um, understand Lee's wanting to use that, you know, to change the term. I think, I think it's true. I mean, the, the story that I come to this panel with, it, it really did feel like a suicide in my grandmother's case. Can you tell us what your story is? Sure. Um, so this was my grandmother. Um, a lot of similarities to the two other stories of um, these, the deaths. She also had talked for quite a while about um, not wanting to end up in a nursing home, not wanting to end up frail and dependent. And she kept, this was um, 30 years ago now, um, she kept materials for the Hemlock Society in her kitchen that is, was sort of one of the pioneering organizations around this issue. And when she was 78, not particularly old, she went to a doctor and found out that she might have cancer. She'd been having some disturbing symptoms, and he wanted her to get tests. She'd always been very healthy, very active, um, an activist in her community, and, um, and she wanted to avoid that. She wanted to avoid the entire experience, and that very night, she went into her garage and sat in her car, and it was effective for her. Um, and I think my family and I, we talked about it a lot, and I guess the reason it, feel, it feels to me like a suicide because, is because it did seem like an act somewhat of desperation um, and of fear. So for me, and, and I start my book with this story because um, then, because I, I just spent a couple of years with people who were caring for elders. Um, so people who were responding to the kind of frailty and need that my grandmother had so dramatically avoided. Um, so for me, she was, she was reacting out of fear, partly to the medical world, because she was very opposed to um, excessive medical intervention and she wanted to be in charge of her own death. But I also think she was also reacting as um, Laurie's father to just the experience of being old in this country. And so it, it really shaped my lens as I followed caregivers. How can we make the experience of caring for our elderly, for, for the elderly and for everyone more of a positive, wise, nurturing experience. Thank you, Now we're gonna, we'll pick that up uh, after our break. We're gonna take a quick break here. Uh, you're listening to A Matter of Life and Death. This is a live community forum. We're live at the JFK Middle School in Northampton, sponsored by Northampton Cable TV, the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and WHMP. We'll be back after these. We're back, and we are live at the JFK Middle School in Northampton. This is a matter of life and death. It's a community forum exploring the care that we provide for our elders as they approach the end of life. I'm Bob Flaherty from WHMP. This is our news director, Denise Vozella, and there's our morning host, Bill Newman, right over there. Bill will be joining us in our second half. Uh, Denise will be leaving after the first half. Our panelists, uh, Nell Lake, Joan Burnsoff, and Latham, Laurie Lozell, and Lee Hawkins. We've invited... Uh, Plenty of people from the audience up to make a comment. We have someone to lead off right now, right? Yes, indeed. Hi. Um, I, I know some of you on the panel, and I'm really um, 
just um, so grateful that you're here. This is not easy stuff. And I'm also grateful that we have such an amazing turnout in our lovely community. Um, and Lori knows a little bit about my story with my dad. Um, because I was one of the people who wrote to her after she um, was very open about what happened with her dad. And I jokingly referred to my dad's um, decision to end his life as Catholic suicide um, because he was at a juncture where he could choose to have intervention and um, he could have lived for several more years, frankly. It was very difficult as his daughter to support his choice because I wanted him around. It's not easy. but. He was lucky in that there was a juncture where he could make a decision to stop eating and drinking, and it was a logical decision because of his diagnosis, and he could go to a hospice facility and do that with support. I think it's a lot more difficult from what I'm hearing to just do that on your own without that impetus of this sort of um, change in your life medically where you, you know, and my dad was ready. He was absolutely ready. He had made his peace with his maker and all of those things. And he just didn't, he had been through enough medical stuff in his life. He had seen what people live like in nursing homes. He was a volunteer and he didn't want to end up like that. And so that was his decision. Around here, I also work, I advocate for people in nursing homes and rest homes for a living. Um, and include, that includes end of life decision making and autonomy and what I would call self-determination rather than suicide. Um, and um, there was a woman who opted to come to go to a nursing home to a safe environment to stop eating and drinking and she was very open about it and boy did it cause a lot of um, confusion um, division in the nursing home with the staff with people from the hospital she came from thinking she must be depressed how could that have happened there must be something wrong nobody could accept the fact that she was simply making this choice, she was ready, she had thought about it long and hard, and um, the, some of the staff I don't think ever quite recovered from the division that it caused a, a, around whether there should be intervention or she, she, she should be left on her own. So yes, we have a long way to go as a society. I just wanted to share those two things. Thank you. We have uh, another young fellow right here, go ahead. I'm glad to be called a young fellow. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, my name is Jeff Zessiger. I'm a hospice and palliative care doctor at Cooley Dickinson and out in the community. Um, it's quite interesting that JM came up because the same case was the case I wanted to bring up, and that was to respond to you and the questions about comfort if you stopped eating and drinking. Um, in this woman's case, she was a very sound mind. Um, her son is an ethicist in our community. Um, and she said, I've had enough. She had fallen, broken her arm. She was able to get around up until that point, but just barely. Um, her mind was perfect. She was adorable. It was great to talk to her. And I was sad when she said, well, I don't want any more of your treatments. I would like to just die. And she said, well, there's nothing you can do legally for me. And I mentioned to her she could stop eating and drinking. So she said, that's a deal. How long is it going to take? And I told her, right, quite honestly, you can stop eating and stay alive for quite a while, many weeks. But if you stop drinking, it's usually two weeks or so. She said, it's a deal. And she put her hand out to say hi. And uh, I said, well, I'll help you. Um, she didn't have any terminal illness, but everything was breaking. Everything was falling apart in her body. And she said, I don't really want to be in a nursing home for a long time. But she was OK to go to a nursing home. She was there. And uh, she had visitors, friends. She had some champagne one day. She had hors d'oeuvre or two. But other than that, she said, no, I, I'm not going to drink or eat. And in three weeks, she died. We had an ethics, uh, we have an ethics committee at Cooley Dickinson, and most hospitals do. And uh, we talked about it after the fact because people were troubled. Um, one person involved at the nursing home was very troubled and brought the case to us. But at the end, we all, except the one person bringing the case, were in agreement that it was her right to do it. She didn't have to have a terminal illness. She just was weary of life. And her body was really, really broken. So that case for me told me that, yes, it's OK. and. It's not painful. She said, my mouth is very dry. All right, we can swab your mouth. But apart from that, 
she stopped being interested in eating <clears throat> after a few days. And then drinking, she just got sleepier and sleepier until she died. I have a question. What do you think would have happened if her family wasn't supportive? It would have been a challenge. We would have had an ethics uh, consultation right away. We would have said, well, we know what your wishes are as a family. Here's her wishes. And we would have had to come together to say, legally, what's OK? And there's nothing illegal about stopping eating and drinking. So I think the ethics committee would have said, we feel for you, both sides. But legally, she can do what she wants. She's of sound mind. And we wouldn't have. Um, as in the other case, which is heart rendering that you brought up, we wouldn't have said, oh, you're crazy. You have to go to the hospital. That just, that's not something we would do. And we have a lot of experience dealing with people at end of life in hospice. We want people to be comfortable. We want them to get what they want. Doctor, you said it wasn't painful for this patient. Is that usual and expected? Exactly. Um, if you stop eating, you, your body starts metabolizing itself, you get ketones in your circulation, and you get a little euphoria. Um, you, you don't really feel bad, so people going on crash diets that don't eat, after the first few days they say, oh, I don't feel like eating, I'm fine. Drinking a dry mouth, is that's pretty tough. Um, but if you swab your mouth, keep chapstick on, that's the worst you're going to experience. Thank you for sharing. Can I ask, well, actually? You have a, a program, too, right? Yes, I'd love to answer yes. your question now. Um, in other states, in other communities, would there be potential legal issues? You know, some of these stories that end up in the news about hospitals interpreting the law one way, and you know, the fact that you were helping this woman, could that become a legal issue for It wouldn't be an, a legal issue for myself, our hospice, um, the staff of the nursing home. But if people aren't comfortable in the whole treatment team, that's when things come up. And I'll plug Joan's husband's other book <laughs> that, that goes into exactly that. And when people aren't together on the team, big trouble happens. But we really talked a lot. We brought everybody in we could. And it was just one person that really was upset. In other communities, I can't say what would happen. But I do know that people have vastly different feelings than I do. And they might get very upset and say, you can't do that. And they'd do anything in their power to subvert it. So you, you would want to make sure you have a good partner in you know, a clinical team to say, yes, I agree. We will help you. Um, while, while I'm here, um, thank you for the plug. We're going to have a follow-up meeting in a month's time, April 1st, here also to talk about if you don't feel you have control, how do you get control? And it's not just what we've talked about tonight, but there are planning forms in the state of Mass that allow you to have your goals and wishes put down on paper, and it's a legal medical document. It's called a MOLST form. So it won't say how do you stop your life, but it'll say how do you have control to make sure you get the treatment you want and not the treatment you don't want. So it'll be here April 1st, 6 to 8 p.m. also. And uh, thank you for letting me speak so much. Doctor, could you say one more minute? Because I'd really like to explain, if you could, what happens with a patient who's been very clear in the past about what she or he wants or doesn't want at end of life, but is now suffering from either Alzheimer's or dementia or some inability uh, cognitively to express him or herself to make that clear to the doctors and the ethicists. What do you do with Cooley Dick? Either at Cooley Dick or anywhere, what you would do is you would look to the uh, health care proxy or the durable power of attorney for medical decision making. And that person you have previously signed up to be, as, as you well know, the person that's going to speak for you if you can't speak. It would be a thorny issue if that person said, I know my mom wants to end her life. That would be very thorny and would go through ethics and legal and I'm not sure how that would turn out. So it's important if you have wishes yourself to try to do them when you're of clear mind. I'll <clears throat> May I just say something about that? Because uh, I think it's really important to also think about um, 
the fact that we we do have a right to um, withhold treatment or to stop treatment. So if one is on dialysis, one can make a decision to stop dialysis. That's not suicide, but one has, to, or if one doesn't want to be intubated, one can um, be very clear legally about not wanting to be intubated if there is, for example, no hope of surviving or you know, there. We get, we have the option legally to articulate our wishes, and um, Jeff just alluded to something called the five wishes, which we can all download online, and we can designate our healthcare proxy, and we can indicate sort of all of the different choice points. If this happens, then this is what I want. If this happens, then this is what I want. Which isn't to say that people don't change their minds. Um, but there, there, it, there are forms of control that we can take. It isn't only that we get to the end of our lives and we have to engage in assisted suicide. We do have a question from one of our WHMP listeners. And if you are listening um, on the radio this evening, you can call Joan in the studio at 586-7140. And she can get the question to us. And the question is from Ginny in West Hampton. And she asks the panel, do you believe religion is the region, reason we're having this discussion at all? And Ginny adds that she plans to end her own life when the time comes. Anybody on the panel can feel free to answer that. We came very close to passing um, a bill that would have allowed for assisted suicide, and it was in the last weeks of the campaign that the Catholic Church put in $5 million, and we, those of us who supported that initiative, um, it, it did not pass by a v tiny, tiny margin. Religion has a great deal to do with this issue, and indeed, um, for those uh, who hold a lot of power in the Catholic Church, there are very strong um, issues around assisted suicide, particularly. I was a you know, I grew up a Catholic, and I was always told that this was a one-way ticket to hell. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's got to be part of it, isn't it? There's got to be, like, I'm doing the wrong thing, right? If you're Catholic. <laughs> well, that may go back, Bob, to the issue of um, calling it suicide as opposed to aid in dying um, or assisted dying or the right to the right to die, um, which is not necessarily the, the road to perdition. Um. <laughs> Ann Latham, you had something that you wanted to say about using the term suicide as well. Yeah, I definitely think we need a different word because to me, suicide is tragic. It's something that should be avoided at all costs. My parents, it, w their ending wasn't tragic. In my opinion, it was a happy ending. It was the best possible ending. It was more of a love story. It was not a tragedy. And I, I really believe there should be a totally different word for it. I mean, Eskimos have 27 words for snow. Why can't two words <laughs> for dying? And it, in my opinion, they ended their dying. They didn't end their living. It's totally different than someone who ends their living at age 17. Nell Lake, author of the book, The Caregivers, a support group stories of slow loss, courage, and love. We've heard many different stories here of family members who, um, whose parents have taken their lives, and in your case, a grandparent. Uh, and we, we hear a lot of um, uh, people who are at peace with their decision, and, but that may not be something that happens right away. Can you walk us through what it takes to get to that point of, of feeling maybe okay with, with these decisions? It, it couldn't be an easy road for some people. A decision to take to end your life their, when the time comes? For family members of loved ones who have made that decision. Yeah. Well, um, the people I followed in my book, there was no one who made that decision. Um, so I almost want to defer to Lee to answer that question. How, you know, um, how you came to that, that point. Um, I think it was probably when I began to realize what I didn't want as I grew older, that I think the two strongest things were I did not want to live or die in a nursing home. 
I'm glad to know that they will take you when you're not eating, because <laughs> I don't have that objection to, to nursing homes, but I just, it's not an atmosphere that I want to live in. One thing I'm willing to die in it. And I guess the other thing is really being able to talk to my kids and get them to feel as comfortable as I do with it. Are they comfortable with your decision? I think so. It, was that a process? Or were they, they comfortable right away? Or did you have to do some convincing? You know, they know me pretty well. <laughs> so I think that it's, they've always kind of sensed that I might feel this way. So that, and it took a, a long time. I don't know when Oregon did this thing originally, but it was a long time ago. So that's been brewing for a very long time. So the conversation is in no way an, oh, let's talk today about how mom goes, is going to die. It's never been that way. It just kind of rolls in and out of our conversation to the point where everyone seems comfortable with it. I think I will just say, I mean, as, as Leah's saying, I think conversation is just so incredibly important. And um, for, for all of us, you know, to, to, for change. Um, and also, I just want to say, too, that I think it's also okay to become frail and go through that process, you know, <laughs> because um, that's part of what I witnessed. And I think if we can become comfortable with that as well, then the whole process, everyone will will feel more comfortable, will find that place of comfort for themselves. I don't do you disagree with you at all. How to have that conversation? Do you have any pointers? <laughs> with, with family How members? Have conversation with family members, if that's something that you're thinking for the end of your life. Well, this is, this is amazing, isn't it? Just doing this, <laughs> but um, I mean, you know, that we're doing this, it might then be easier to go and talk with family members, right? Um, in my experience, well, having worked on my book, I went and had the first conversation with my mother, which I may not have, have had. And it was just, and you know, thankfully, she's still healthy and, um, you know, vital. And so I could start that conversation while she still is. And it was just, let's just, let's have a conversation. Let's talk about what you imagine as you get older. What do you want? She, you know, she had done some thinking about it, so it made it easier. And also, we have a close relationship, so it's not as easy, I think, when you don't have as close a relationship. But um, any kind of getting comfortable with it yourself to then start becoming, to, to helping your family members become comfortable with it too, whether it's bringing up an article, bringing up coming to this um, event, things like that. We have a question from the audience. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to address um, Bill Newman's concerns on how this plays out in other places in the country. Uh, the, the, the baking coolie, I can't remember which, was a famous thoracic surgeon. He'd done it for many years. He had written out his health care proxy. Everything was spelled out in entirety. He developed his chest pain. He made the diagnosis of, in his own subspecialty and says, I want to go home and be, treat me comfortably. And as the story develops, he, his, they waited until he went into a coma. And then his third wife intervened and said, this is wrong. And they put him on a ventilator on dialysis and did the whole shebang. And um, he lived through the whole thing. And I'm not sure if anybody asked him particularly what he thought about it afterwards. But you know, the chance to do anything about this is really before you. Um, the d dilemma is that you have to do something before you fall into the hospital in many cases. You know, we've certainly heard some very benign stories out of Cooley Dickinson Hospital, but these are, they are benign, and I think they're perhaps exceptional to the big battles that go on, and that despite how good your plans are, they fall apart as you do lose control. They're, or they can, and that is significant um, 
problem. And the, the hope is that you, your physician will um, help you out in the end. And um, having done that, I must say that I have done participated in this, and the people I've helped to assist in suicide were actually the people from um, some of the better nursing homes who were articulate and could engage me as an equal in the intellectual discussion, and those people got pills. And the people who um, didn't, I could not culturally bind with prayed to Jesus each night that, that Jesus would take them away, and I, for as far as I could tell, the contract was between her and Jesus. Um, and that these things all sort of worked off individually. And the hope is that for the physicians will help you. And I'm afraid that the physicians that sometimes have gotten intimidated, partly because of the war on drugs and the intimidation that forces to conform. And that it, oftentimes, as you point out, that we can't, as in other countries, depend upon um, the physicians. Um, and we do have to depend upon our own skill set. and. Um, carbon monoxide poisoning is something that's available for everybody and it's not particularly, may not be, and um, just stopping eating. At some point, if you, if you lose your appetite for life, you should be able to lose your appetite for food and water. Maybe we could bring in Lee Hawkins here for a minute. Um, you're not the first person who said, I'm not going to go to a nursing home. I think everybody says that. Uh, and then most go to a nursing home. <laughs> um, when you determine that the time is at hand, how do you know you're going to have the guts to do this? Well, I wonder that too, you know. I don't know. That's, that's the one thing. You can't try this out. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, I'm not so sure that I'm that courageous and I feel a little guilty talking to all these people and feeling as though I have to now tell it all. And I've already said I'm not promising you. We're not going to hold you to it. We've only got a minute before break here, but maybe we could talk a little bit about courage. Do you, Anne, do you feel that your parents are courageous here? Do you see this in any way as a romantic act? I, I think it's incredibly courageous. I, I, my, um, my cousin's reaction was, oh, oh my God, they're, they're my heroes. And I agree very much with their sentiments. I understand why they did what they did. And I hope someday I have the courage to do the same thing. There's that scene in the Titanic. The Titanic is going down and these elderly people are down in the state's room. They know they're gonna drown. They hold on to each other as the water rises up to their necks. Is this a romantic thing? I mean, I mean, should we? Are these, well, her is this heroic? I would like to say one thing about that. <laughs> because I do think it's courageous, but I also think it's courageous to live. So I, I just think it's simplistic to say it's courageous. I mean, sure, it takes guts. What my father did, you know, w was really hard, but I also feel like it was a really lonely thing to do. He did it all by himself. Mm -hmm. And it's not what I would wish for him, so. Family, I don't think people on the Titanic have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> and, and this is all about choice. Um, somebody else. Yeah, why don't you come up to the mic? I just wanted to ask a quick question of Bill, a little clarity. Isn't there a Massachusetts medical directive, and isn't that legal? Yeah. That, that you can fill out and sign and everybody have a copy of, and then so there's no issues if you are not conscious and those stipulated Yes, to, yes to everything right. except the part where there are no issues. <laughs> well, it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty detailed. The medical directive can, in fact, say explicitly what you want done if you are not able to make your, to express yourself. Yes, that's absolutely true. So that's good in the... We're going to take a break here. This is a matter of life and death. We're broadcasting live from the JFK Middle School in Northampton. This is a joint effort with Northampton Cable TV, the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and WHMP. So we're going to take a break. We're about a five-minute break. We'll be back after these. We're back. 
We're live, the JFK Middle School in Northampton. We've got a big crowd here. This is a community forum, a WHMP community forum sponsored by WHMP and the Daily Hampshire Gazette and Northampton Cable TV. This is a matter of life and death, a community forum. Our panelists are Ann Latham of West Hampton. Her 90-year-old parents killed themselves in 2013. Laurie Lozell, who's the Gazette's managing editor. Her family elected to go public uh, with the cause of death when her father killed himself in 2012. Author Nell Lake of the book, The Caregivers. They support groups, stories of slow loss, courage, and love. Dr. Joan Burzoff, director of the End of Life Certificate Program at the Smith College School of Social Work. And 90-year-old Lee Hawkins of Northampton, who speaks about ending her life in the near future. Uh, once again, uh, audience members, you're welcome to take part. We have a microphone right here. Just step right up to the mic. Uh, people who are listening at home, you can call our producer, Joan Holliday, at 586-7140, and she will text your question to us. A Matter of Life and Death will be broadcast live tomorrow morning on 96.9 FM and 1400, 1600 AM WHMP. Let's start off our second hour with Bill Newman. Thanks, Bob. I'd like to direct a question to Lori Lazell, if I might, because we're here this evening in significant part because of the incredibly moving piece that you wrote for the Gazette. And I read it and said, this is an amazing piece of journalism. It is an amazing memoir. And it took real courage to write it. So I would like to ask you, having gone through this experience with your father's death, his self-inflicted death, where does that leave you when you think about these issues? Do you say, I'm going to do something like this? I'm not going to a nursing home. I'm going to maintain my independence. Somehow, when I know the time has come, I'm going to take my own life? Oh, that's a great question. Well, I think we should work on making our nursing homes really fun places to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, 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 I've been thinking about it a lot, really, and, um, and as I, I said, I feel like it was his right to do what he did. I wish he hadn't done it the way he did it, and I think he did it prematurely, and I'm entitled to my opinion. But, um, but for me, I hope that I have the courage to go through aging with my family, you know, and that I talk to them and embrace whatever next thing is going to happen to me. So I, I hope that I can have um, a feeling of curiosity about what's going to happen next. And um, so that I don't, and I, I can't help but feel like what my father did came from a place of fear. I, I know it did. He, he left us a very loving note um, and it said, um, and, and I feel he had mixed feelings about it too because he himself called it a tragedy. And um, he said, um, I have to do this to avoid future hurt. He didn't say, like, I'm in pain now. He was afraid of what was going to come next. And, and so I just feel like he robbed himself of, of the experience of aging and us being there with him to help him do it. Well, you used the word prematurely, which I'm really interested in, because when the time comes that you really need to do this, many people are physically or mentally right. unable to do this. So there yeah. is probably not a magic moment when you say, aha, mm -hmm. tomorrow I won't be able to have quality of life that is good enough for me. Yeah. And I think life work, it works that way magically somehow. Well, all right, you have a good point there. And that's what my partner keeps saying to me. <laughs> you know, he, <laughs> he had to do it before he couldn't do it. Um, and I see that point too, but I still feel like, you know, at, at his uh, memorial service, many people stood up and said he was like the most vibrant person they had met in in the way he was when he died you know so I mean, he just like two weeks before he did this he or he um ordered a book from the library and it was 50 shades of gray you know like <laughs> i mean who does that before you kill yourself you know he was still involved in life and so yes I he was very involved in life <laughs> <laughs> i mean i just feel like I can't help but think if we had um, made people feel like they had more control at the end of their life, they would feel like they could skate up to the edge of it better. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. if that makes sense? Mm -hmm. I feel like it has something to do with his fear of losing the ability to do what he felt yeah. he needed to do. Even though I said to him, I'll help you if you need help. 
um, but I don't think you need to do this now. You know, we had really, really frank discussions in the two days before he did this. Lori, what about those left behind you and your other family members? Do you feel that this is a selfish decision on, uh, that your father made? Um, I mean, I, other people do um, in my family. I, I, I don't know. I feel like he, he did what he felt he had to do. Because we talk a lot about you know, the, the rights of the person to make that decision for themselves. What about the people who are left behind? Doctor, do you have any thoughts? Well, on I, I think, it, again, I think it's really an issue of communication. There are many families that do discuss this, that discuss it very deeply. Um, again, I, I alluded to the five wishes. This is something that all of you can download. This is a decision-making process that one does with one's health care proxy and ideally with one's family members that really is about how you want to think about the end of your life and what you what you would tolerate, what you don't want, and it's a legal document. It's an it's an addendum to your health care pro proxy, and it will be honored if you're lucky and things go well enough. Um, but it is a way of having a conversation with the people you love, so that. Uh, when when the decision is made to turn off the respirator or to not uh, have any aggressive treatment, there can be guilt. I mean, I will I will say, and I guess I'll say it publicly. Um, when my sister died, she failed to have a health care proxy. She was 48 years old, um, and she had had two bone marrow transplants, which had failed. I was the donor, um, and so the greatest fear she had was being cognitively impaired and being paralyzed. Both things happened. She became cognitively impaired. She became paralyzed. She was certainly in no position to make the decision to die, and no one came to her teaching hospital to say, uh, we'll send you to hospice. In fact, they said, we'll send you home, which of course was impossible. So I forged and faxed her health care proxy, which then allowed the hospital to allow her to die. But it was awful. And so as a family member, for many years, um, I had tremendous guilt. Even though I absolutely knew those were her wishes, there was a part of me that said, why didn't she have a health care proxy? Um, obviously, there was some ambivalence there. And I felt guilty. I felt, even though I, I believe to this day it was the right decision, I still dream about her. And I dream that she's angry with me. So, um, can I bring in Nell Lake for just a second here? Um, you're coming sort of from a different end of this with your caregivers book, where you spent time with caregivers. And is it safe to say that they're almost a victim too? Because a, a lot of I've interviewed a lot of caretakers who become sick themselves from the ordeal that they go through. Um, you speak about a slow grief in your book. Um, how it just goes on and on, people who take care of uh, sick people. Uh, there's one woman that you uh, talk about uh, who took care of sick relatives, a number of sick relatives, one after another. These illnesses, she say, they go on and on and on and on. Uh, is it grief at that point? Is the grieving over at that point? Is there sort of a degree of resentment with caretakers having to take care of someone for a long period of time? Is the grieving over after the death? Is that what you mean? Or? I think in some cases that the the person's still alive and you're already grieving them. Is that oh, absolutely. The yeah, no, that's what I mean by slow <laughs> loss in the subtitle of my book. And this one caregiver talked about slow grief. Um, yeah, that, well, people used to die much more quickly um, throughout history. And now, because of medical advances and, um, and because of probably better nutrition and whatever, we're living much longer, but we are also living with chronic illness, um, often multiple chronic illnesses, much higher rates of dementia, and in particular with dementia, um, there is this ongoing slow decline that um, family members have to respond to, and it means a, a reordering of relationships, whether it's a parent-child relationship, a spouse-spouse relationship, and it's a constant adjustment. And it's very stressful to go through that kind of what one psychologist has called ambiguous loss, where the loss is not clear. We don't have markers for it. We don't have funerals for it. Um, <clears throat> but we have to cope with it on and on and on. Um, so 
yes, that is that was a very common experience among the people I followed. Um, at the same time, I just wanted to say that um, I think there is real value in caring for each other. <laughs> and um, I wouldn't want this conversation to become about how to avoid that altogether in our society because I think that's actually a real weakness of our society that we want to just have everything have a solution and have everything have a um, clean, you know, kind of purpose. And in fact, throughout history, we have cared for one another. And um, courage can mean facing that as well, it can mean facing that ambiguity, coming back to difficult circumstances, and facing suffering. You know, I, I would like to talk as much about what a good death means as what, um, you know, an, an, an aided death means. And that, that can mean all kinds of things. What do you mean by a good death? Well, I think it, it means, I think it can mean any, it can, I think it means a, a relatively peaceful death. And it, it um, and that can mean doing the kind of work like the five wishes so that you aren't having the kind of interventions at the end of life that make it a very stressful death in an ICU, you know, um, so that you do that kind of preparing, but also, um, and, and, and the kind of talking so that the family is there, people know what you want. Um, and it could be that a good death means making the decision to um, end your life in the way that you've decided to. Um, Ann Latham, did you have something you wanted to add? Yes, I, I, I think we should avoid this debate that it's more courageous to end your life or more courageous to live. I think that's a ridiculous debate. The courage is in looking at the issues, facing the situation, understanding your options, making your decision, and following through. So it can be courageous in either direction. That's not the point. I think the important thing is that everybody is different. And while some of, I've heard talk from both Lori and Nell about this caring for each other and, and being willing to be cared for, that varies from individual to individual. My parents were fiercely independent. They didn't want anyone to care for them. I don't remember my father ever talking about health. That was not something you talked about. And it wasn't because of some taboo subject. He, didn't, he just didn't want to go there. That was not him. I know people who like to be cared for. They like to be cared for all the time, and they want people to show they're caring. It's, people are different. You have to figure out what's right for you. You can't decide for anybody else. We do have a question from an, an audience member. And if you could speak into the mic so that everybody can hear you in the back. I recently <clears throat> heard about and looked online Ellen Goodman, the reporter for the Boston Globe, has something called the Conversation Project. And I wondered if people here were familiar with it. I, she, there's a video where she says that she had a long talk with her adult daughters, and they realized that there needed to be. So there's a whole panel of experts like you in Boston that have put together this thing called the Conversation Project. Maybe what you're kicking off here is that here. But I don't wonder if you're familiar with it. And the one other thing I just popped in my head when you were talking about a good death. Some years ago, I read a book by the historian Gerda Lerner called The Death of One's Own. And she wrote a profile of an aunt and uncle of hers that chose to die with dignity in Switzerland. Um, and she was writing this while her own husband was dying, and she was grappling with his death and the thoughts of her own death. And I haven't seen it in years, but I just realized that it addresses what you're talking about, a good death. That's what she was seeking out in her book. But I wonder if you could tell us if anything about the conversation project. Apparently, there's materials to download to help you start the family conversation. Um, there are a number of conversation projects nationally. Yes, yes. Are there others? If you could yes. hear, we could write the, it down. The um, conversationproject.org is Ellen Goodman's website. Go ahead. Go ahead. I would like to add one also, um, deathcafe.com. There's a global movement of death cafes. It started, some say in Paris, some say in London, and it's just recently come into Western Massachusetts. I've attended two in the last three weeks, and there's one planned for Amherst on uh, March 26. If you go to deathcafe.com, you can see what the idea is you have tea and cake, and you're safe confidential community it, place in a cafe or a home and you talk about death and this is 
very powerful. Often people who are there say, my family don't want me to talk about this. I can't talk with my kids about this. I'm so glad you're here. We can talk together about the issues. We can get, build up our vocabulary of how we'll talk about this with our family to keep the communication going. So I don't know how the conversation, it seems like we're all going to the same place saying more communication. I'm a volunteer with a group called the Funeral Consumers Alliance of Western Massachusetts. And our members get a booklet called Before I Go, You Should Know. And it's another variation on like the five wishes and chances to express on a piece of paper and hopefully tell your family where the piece of paper is, even if you can't talk to them, of the decisions that you've made. Um, the national group that we're affiliated with has a very simple website, funerals.org. And they'll sell you this for 15 bucks, or you can download it for nine bucks. Thank or you can join us and we give it to you. Thank you. We do have another t uh, question that was called into WHMP. Um, a man called to say that he is severely disabled and he feels that the severely disabled are left out of the end of life conversation. He uh, says that people die in a lot less pain than he has in one month and he thinks too much money is being made on keeping people alive, which keeps assisted suicide from becoming legal. He said he would be here tonight if he could and calls himself a concerned citizen. Uh, can we address the, the issue of, of someone who is severely disabled and, and going through pain as an, an everyday occurrence throughout their lives? Well, I think it's a very complicated issue. Um, I think that many who um, suffer with disabilities are very scared about um, assisted suicide because there is a, a question of their rights and the fear, and certainly it was Sarah Palin who, who worked on that fear, that there will be death panels that people who are uh, less able to contribute uh, will be the first to, uh, in a eugenics kind of way, the first people chosen to die. Um, that's been a very powerful argument that's been used by the right wing and has been used by the Catholic Church. Um, and it, it has a lot of traction. But I think this man is asking something different. He's saying, what about the disabled's right to die? And that's a, a very good question and a very nuanced question. Um, and I think I would open it to others to struggle with that. It's a, it's a complicated legal, ethical, moral um, issue. Well, Dr. John Burtzoff, let me pose the question back to you because I think it raises a larger question, although I don't want to lose track of what about the rights of the disabled. But that said, how do you know, how do you ethically know when the time has come, whether it's the five wish wishes or a very detailed medical directive, you, it will say, in essence, for people who are saying, I would w don't want to live without some quality of life, when I get to a quality of life where I can't do this or this or this or this, don't treat me, don't give me nutri nutrition, don't give me hydration, all of those things can be said. But you know, what separates Wednesday from Tuesday and Thursday from Wednesday and Saturday from Tuesday is not clear. And by the way, it's not linear. It doesn't simply happen on a nice even slope because there'll be bad days and good days. And you may say, well, this, my mother, my dad will let him die on Tuesday, but on Wednesday he said, oh my God, I'm glad I didn't do it because he looks pretty good today. How do you solve those ethical issues? How do you address them, both medically so, and as a as, and as a professional in this area, what do you teach? What do you teach your students? My Take students your time. teach me. <laughs> <laughs> My students teach me. Um, and I, you know, I think what you're raising, Bill, is is that there's also a tremendous will to live, and so we may we may set out what we think we want, and there has to be the room for ambivalence. There has to be the room to change our minds. There has to be the room to say, as my mother kept saying. I just want to see one more thing happen. I just want to see <laughs> this one get married or this one have a baby. And there was always one more thing. So this steadfast civil rights activist who insisted she was going to take her life, there was, she kept moving the bar. And I think that many people move the bar and should move the bar because that's what life is about, is about living. Well, let me just follow up that. 
a lot of these directives say when I get to a quality of life or a position in quality of life, I don't want to live anymore. But in fact, the quality of life for individuals who have some cognitive disabilities changes. And the things are different in their lives. And if they could see themselves or imagine themselves in this situation, they might not have made that exact directive. And I'm sure you've seen this. How do you address that situation? You know, they're happy in a way that they never thought they would be happy because they assume that if they don't have all their mental faculties, they are definitionally unhappy because that's who they are. That's how they define themselves. Well, you can't. I'm getting a lot of nods on the panel. You, you can't end <laughs> someone's life because they have dementia or Alzheimer's. I mean, that's considered murder. So you can't do that. Um, and it's, you know, we all say, kill me before I become demented. Um, but you're absolutely right. Many people, you know, again, the bar moves. And quality of life can include some loss of cognitive functioning. Um, but again, we don't get to make the decision that I want to die or withdraw my nutrition and hydration if I become demented. That is still considered murder. That's not OK. You can't do that. Um, so it's, it's, it's not that. Uh, it's not that that is considered a life-threatening condition in which uh, uh, medical treatment can be withheld. Um, you can't do that for a cognitive impairment, right? You're the lawyer. Yes, but, you, but the person who has a cognitive impairment who has a treatable cancer, that's a combination of factors that gets really difficult. And it gets really difficult for the person holding that medical proxy. It sure does. And that is the complexity in which we call the social worker. And that is what social workers and chaplains are trained to help families with. These are not linear decisions. They're not simple decisions. And they're not clear. And I think the example of my sister was pretty unclear. Um, did I do the right thing? I still will struggle with it for the rest of my life. It wasn't clear. Things aren't always clear. Lee, did you have something that you wanted to add? I just wanted to say that that's why I want to make the decision before I lose my ability to make decisions. Because even though I may be content afterward, I care about a lot of people that are not going to be content then. I'd like well, to, to hang on, hang on. But we're a couple of minutes to break here. Let's uh, go. This Just gentleman. a quick question, Joan. On the li the five wishes, you said that that is that a legal addendum to a health care proxy? Yes, it is. How does that differ from a living will? I'm going to defer to our lawyer because he will do a better job than I in being articulate. Yeah, I, I don't. Th I think the living will is actually an anachronism. I don't think there is such a thing that really makes a lot of sense anymore. Living will has to do, it used to have to do with giving a judge a directive of this is how I feel in this situation. If you're making a decision about withholding treatment, here's what I want to do. This has really been replaced as a practical matter with health care proxies and addendums too, which are really just more exact definitions and, and of what should occur in a health care proxy. So the five, the five wishes clearly seems the way to go. Um, the five wishes and the most, uh, having a conversation with your doctor about your preferences as well. The, that which Jeff Zesinger is going to hold a meeting in this room in a few weeks about, which is another document um, that your physician holds. And it's a very important decision-making tree as well. Thank you. We're about uh, a minute uh, from break here. Um, I got a call, and I think I want the panelists to think about this as we go into the break, I got a call from a listener, uh, not a, yeah, voice message. And she was talking about the will to live. And that people in Auschwitz, for instance, had this tremendous will to live, enduring these abominable conditions. Um, so she's thinking that somehow, I guess we're expected to go on and on and carry forth and that sort of thing. Um, so I think she was disappointed, I think, with people who have lost the quote-unquote will to live. So why don't we kind of chew that off a little bit and we'll, we'll take a break here and uh, come back in just a couple of seconds. This is a matter of life and death. This is a live community forum from the JFK Middle School in Northampton in conjunction with uh, WHMP, the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and Northampton Cable TV. We're going to take a five-minute break. We'll be back after these. Thanks. 
We're live at the JFK Middle School in Northampton, Massachusetts. This is a WHMP Daily Hampshire Gazette NCTV live community forum, a matter of life and death exploring the care we provide for our elders as they approach the end of life. Um, we asked the panel to think about a few things before we went to break. We have an audience member right now that would like to pose something to the folks. Hi, um, <clears throat> my name is Barbara Smith. Lee and I think Laurie both alluded to this earlier and um, I'm sure it's come up with other people, but I'd love to hear what people have to say about the whole idea of nursing homes we don't like, um, the whole idea of why we don't like getting older, why it is so hard. Um, some things are obvious, things you know are harder to do, we have aches and pains, but we also are made anonymous. Uh, uh, Lori was talking about her father who lived in a place that had a lot of um, elderly people who weren't doing well. My mother lives in a community where every time I come and visit her, she says with a very sad voice, oh, so-and-so's wife has dementia or so-and-so's husband has cancer. Um, and I can hear the fear in her voice when she says that. So I would love to, if anyone can, um, can talk about the, I, I see it as the larger issue um, besides the ones we've been talking about. Anybody like to take that one? My father wouldn't have gone into a nursing home even if it was the best place in the world. <laughs> I just don't buy it. I mean, yes, some of them are bad and some of them are miserable, but I'd just like to say that I think in general it's not the nursing home that we object to. It's the fact that there are so many people living there who are no longer living. I mean, they're sitting beautifully dressed, looked really cared for, and they're sagging in their chairs all day long. And Lori says, make nursing homes more inviting or livelier. I don't remember what your term was. But you can't do that with them. It's sad to know that you can't really energize people that no longer have that energy. I mean, I, I'd like to ask this question to all the panel, too, because we left the before the break with the question about people who have lost the will to live. And I think in some ways that actually misstates the question, because to me the question is as much what about people who have very definitively said, I have a will to die because this is not life as I know it. This just isn't really worth it anymore. So I think that those questions actually intersect. I don't think that this planned death or the self-determination of death necessarily means a loss of a will to live. I think it may be a realization of the lack of the ability to control one's own life or have a quality of life that you feel is life. I think your example of the nursing home is exactly right, which is that doesn't look like life to a lot of people, and it doesn't look like life to me. You know, I, I think the issue is about choice, and I think the reason this room is packed um, has to do with many of us are grappling with choice as baby boomers and as activists, former activists. We grew up in a time um, in which we felt... Uh, now watch that former stuff. I'm <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, in which we felt we, you know, we would work very hard for choice. We were pro-choice. Um, many of us are still pro-choice. And I think just as there is a, a debate about whether one has the right to, to control one's body at uh, conception and, and through pregnancy, there is the same flip side of the issue and it has to do with choice at the end of life. It, these, these two things are very much connected. So I don't think it's about a will to live. I think it's about a right to choose. And I, obviously there is no right choice. Um, but there, the fact that um, we as baby boomers and people who are aging feel that we want a right to be able to live a self-determined life. Um, there was a, a letter to the editor, and this was in response to Lee Hawkins' story. And um, she took exception to 
what you're proposing to do from a Christian perspective. And uh, the quote, uh, it, there are multiple ways available to manage and minimize the different struggles that accompany the dying process that allow death to occur with peace and dignity. Any truth in this? Again, this is about a <coughs> right to choose, and that includes one's spiritual beliefs, one's religious beliefs. Um, there are many cultures, there are many religions, um, not only Catholicism, that um, do not support the right to die. Um, again, it, these, are, these are decisions that are determined by, again, culture, religion, often social class, sometimes race, sometimes economic disparities. There are, there are um, many layers and it's a complex issue. I would like to talk briefly about uh, not the choice between life and death, but the choice between a nursing home and being cared for at home by loved ones. That's another end of life choice that, that many uh, families have to make. My 70 year old mom lives with my family and she has told me that she doesn't want me to have to care for her if she needs a, intensive care, but she would never have put her mom in a nursing home. So, <laughs> <laughs> not quite sure what I'm supposed to do with that. <laughs> But that's the discussion we've had so far, and I think that we probably need to talk a little bit more. But how, how do you uh, come to a place where you're both comfortable with that kind of uh, choice? And, and Nell, you talk about caregivers. Um, I'm sorry, no, I put on my glasses. Hmm. Am I asking the right person? Yes, Nell. <laughs> <laughs> about uh, caregivers and how caregivers need support as well, and probably support in making these, these decisions about whether to care for a parent at home. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how to how to have that conversation and oh have the conversation way. with your mother yeah yeah, but which you may not have been able to do for the first 60 or 70 years. You know, it's not, it's not a simple yeah. question. Well, it sounds like you've had some conversation. We've started, but for for in in general. Uh, so, mom, are you you know is it never a nursing home? Is that what you're saying? You know, um, I think just. The, you know, m as many questions as you can fit in, you know, at different times, just, and probably the conversation will get easier and easier. And if there's any way to kind of insert a little humor, if that fits in your relationship at all, you know, I think that that helps. I'm guessing uh, there are questions that you probably, as the potential caregiver, you could have her read my book as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I mean, you know, and scenarios. Mom, let's say you, you need a walker. You know, like assess, assess your house. Is the house fit for her declining abilities? Um, let's talk about safety. Let's say you end up in a wheelchair. Um, and then even broach the difficult subject. Let's say you end up with dementia, you know. Um, is maybe provide her with some stories about people who, that's why I mentioned my book, you know, about the kind of process that can happen and it can be a long, slow process, but increasing needs and decisions to be made all along the way. And um, I think you can come up with kind of a care, a, sort of a plan that it's understood that that's going to adapt as things change. Now, I'd like to ask you this question. In, in this group of caregivers that you followed in your book. Some of whom are in this room, I want you to know. I'm wondering if the situation arose where they c give care for years and years and they look at their loved one and they say, my mother, my husband would never want to be alive if he or she could see himself this way. And here I am doing something out of the goodness of my heart and out of love that in fact is exactly what the person doesn't want wouldn't want if they were still at least cognitively able to say, here are my wishes. Did you see that? And how did people deal with it? I think in some way, that's really where you should enter again and say, why is it that you wouldn't do that with your own mother, and yet you think I shouldn't do it? Well, what is different now? Because she may have a real reason for that. 
may not be saying, I'm sacrificing to you, which is what it sounds like. I'll have to admit that the conversation really didn't go anywhere because I was uncomfortable with it. Yeah. And so this forum is even helpful to me in that way. So thank you for sharing. We have an audience member here. <coughs> Yes, um, as far as the question about uh, whether to go to a nursing home or to be taken care of at home, I'm interested in the economic part of that. Uh, I'm horrified at the cost of nursing homes, nine or ten thousand dollars a month. Uh, so, you know, at that rate, wouldn't it be a lot cheaper to to be at home? And and I'm wondering if that's true, whether really it ends up being more expensive to be at home. Is, is there any uh, input about this question? It, it depends, I think. I mean, it depends on the level of need. Maybe there are people in the audience who can <laughs> answer this better, but um, if, if you need 24-hour care from a home health aide, for instance, I think, it, yeah, it can be more expensive than a nursing home but if it's you know so you have to assess like what what is the person's needs can can someone just come in and help with a shower and maybe help with medications or is it a huge fall risk a big you know a real safety issue or just totally someone totally unable to take care of themselves i i do um, probably many people know this but unfortunately medicare doesn't cover many of those kinds of long-term care needs whereas Medicaid um, covers many more of those. And so what I witnessed were, was people having to spend down until they qualified for Medicaid in order to have those kind of needs covered. And that's a really unfortunate reality right now. The, um, Laura Loisel, um, this whole thing started, of course, with the article that you wrote about your father when he shot himself. And the idea for you and your family to go public with this, which is not a, the usual thing. People who haven't read this article are familiar with the story. At the service itself, where you were embraced by family for making this decision, another bombshell with your father's brother came out of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you mean you want me to tell that story? Yeah, yeah. Well, just that, um, so my father killed himself and my aunt came to the service and pulled my siblings and I aside afterwards to say that his brother had killed himself two years before at the same age same way um, but she had never they were Catholic and it was she would never told anybody not even her 90 year old mother and I know she didn't he didn't she uh, she didn't tell my father so that was just a weird family story <laughs> so there were two um, yeah. Um, Do you think he knew? I don't believe that my father knew because we had so many conversations and he's kind of a blabbermouth and he would have just told me. He would have said, Don did it, so why shouldn't I? And um, <laughs> so I 100% I, I know that he didn't know. It's just a weird thing. Um, this is a thing that, there's a, there are things that bother me that maybe don't bother other people. Uh, people who listen on the radio know this to be true. Um, do we have any fear here? If this becomes an accepted thing, right now is just the beginning of this. We're having a conversation about that. If it becomes a, an acceptable thing for someone to take their own life, when we're talking here, we're talking about people in their twilight years. We're talking about people who maybe don't have a lot of time left. If we were talking about someone com contemplating suicide at the age of 17, we'd be having a whole different discussion. So if this becomes a little bit more acceptable in the coming years, What's to prevent me? Hey, I might have a stroke someday. I think I'll take care of it now. I'm going out now. What is to prevent that from happening? And is that acceptable? I'm 40 years old. Uh, I can't go on. That's it. Um, is that a whole different conversation? Or I'm 17 and I'm sick. Hmm. There's a huge difference. I mean, it's, it goes back to that will to live. Uh, when my father's, when my parents died and my, my uncle heard about it, my cousin was telling me, well, her father had such a strong will to live, he had survived cancer, he can't even fathom what my parents did. I go, yeah, but you can survive cancer. You can survive a, a stroke when you're younger, perhaps. You, you can survive a lot of years, pr presumably, when you're 17. If you, if you live through Auschwitz, you've got a whole lot of life before you. You can't survive old age, it'll kill you. 
Well, Ann Latham, I'd like to ask you this. You, you described before your parents' death that they committed together and as really a love story. And I'm wondering, even with that perspective, whether you ever looked at it and said, gee, I wish they waited another day, another week, another month. Did you have any of those feelings? No. And why do you think that this was the time? Why was this uh, the date? Why was it the right time for them? I how think. Did, and how did they know? I think they were going downhill pretty fast. Um, my father, when I would call and talk to them on the phone and say, how you doing? He'd say, well, we're still buying green bananas. And then one day, <laughs> <laughs> then he would say, well, you know, we're, yeah, we're getting along. We're, we're pretty, you know, things, things are good. Mostly, you know, we're, we're having nice dinners, nice bottle of wine, enjoying ourselves, watching the deer outside. But then uh, it, it started creeping in there. He stopped, stopped talking about the green bananas. He started talking more about how everything is so much work. And, um, I, you know, I know that they had been thinking about it for a period of time because, you know, they went to the store three days beforehand. Uh, so they, and bought more milk than they needed, clearly. So, but I also know that in order to go to the store that day, I heard the story. My mother was in great pain for back problems, um, severe back problems. And my father, my, my parents' driveway went down at an angle to the road. And he was having neck pain and couldn't turn his head well enough to see if he could get out on the road. So to go to the store that last time, my mother got in the car and sat backwards in the passenger seat so she could tell him when it was clear. And that must have been excruciatingly painful for him. So I know it was just a matter of their saying, look, you know, the, our days are numbered here. Today's a good day. And they, uh, they didn't just do it instantly. They tidied everything up. There wasn't a dish in the dishwasher. The dishes were cleaned in the cupboard. The waste baskets were emptied. Uh, Dave, the snowplow guy, had been paid. The bills were paid ahead. Uh, the last thing they did was write checks to the three granddaughters who had never had the chance of foreign travel like how they had assisted the older granddaughters. And they wrote those checks for foreign travel and they put them in the mail and then that was it. So, you know, they decided I, when I got the email saying this is, we're, we're checking out, I went back and forth all night. I, I knew they didn't tell everybody. Um, they didn't tell my siblings because I think they trusted that I wouldn't save them. So uh, I spent that whole night going, does exit mean what I think it means? And if so, I sure hope they're for successful. And you know, but probably I'll call in the morning and they'll answer the phone. But in the meantime, I was Googling, what do you do when someone dies at home? So I mean, I was just going in circles on this thing, trying to figure out where things were at. But I pretty much immediately felt like th they were there, they knew they were there, and I was just really pleased that they were able to make this decision together, that they were able to realize that this was a good choice for them and that they would follow through. And I just hope they did it right. Uh, let me we need minutes here. Um, if there are listeners at uh, home, you can call our producer, Joan Holiday at 586-7140 if you have any questions. We only have a few minutes left. We're gonna go to uh, the audience right now, John. Thanks, I, I'm John from Northampton. First of all, this has been great. What a great forum. Thank you, organizers. Thank you, participants. The articles were great in the paper. Um, here's what I want to add to the conversation. Um, a little more than 10 years ago, my mom ended her life at the age of 81 in pretty good health. It was through uh, overdose of medications. She was uh, not a happy woman all her life. Uh, in fact, she was suicidal for uh, different periods during her life. Uh, to me, it was a legitimate option and one that I respect and respected that, you know, what she was looking, what she was facing uh, in terms of leaving her apartment, living independently. So that's, that's what happened in my own life. Um, on the disability issue, I want to say there's a lot of movies, you know, and a lot of books and a lot of, you know, inspiring stuff. But one for me is called The Sea Inside, S-E-A, The Sea Inside, Spanish movie uh, with that famous actor Javier Bardem. He plays a guy who was paralyzed uh, at age 21 and at 55. He said, I've had enough, paralyzed from neck down. Um, incredibly moving film, of, and he, start, he actually sparked a death with dignity movement, which uh, the, whole, the whole country of Spain passed a law, I think this is 
1999. So I would really recommend that, and there's plenty of other good resources. And on the dementia issue, um, I read a book recently called A Better Way of Dying by a doctor named Jean Fitzpatrick, and she talks about exit events that when people, especially with Alzheimer's or, you know, long term, they don't have a terminal illness, they don't have cancer, they have Alzheimer's, they can live five, ten years, whatever, but they have many things like pneumonia uh, and other conditions that send them to the hospital They because we have the technology. But if you have, before you have uh, dementia, if you signed a MOLST or a, um, a Five Wishes, things like that, communicated very clearly with doctors, family, everybody, uh, you don't want to go to the hospital for just pneumonia because that's what can take you in a, in a, in a positive exit event. So that, that kind of opened my eyes a, a great deal that way. And lastly, I just want to say, um, yeah, death cafes and conversation projects, um, Right here in this community, I've been offering a, a group, a support group called Living Fully, Aging Gracefully, and Befriending Death. It meets every two weeks, uh, sometimes in Franklin County, sometimes here in Hampshire County. Um, it's been a rich conversation, just like this forum, and we need as much of it as possible. And if anybody's interested in that, you can just let me know. Thanks for doing this. Thank you, John. Um, we've only got a few minutes left. Joan Burzoff, Um Terry Schiavo, I think I'm pronouncing the name right, she was this beautiful young woman you might remember, suffered a heart attack, was kept on life support in a vegetative state for 15 years as relatives clashed in the courts. Uh, you published an article not long ago, Lessons from Terry Schiavo. Uh, what should we learn from that case? Well, I mean, that was, that was a really tragic story. Um, Terry Schiavo's husband felt very strongly that he was the health care proxy. There was no health care proxy. He felt that he rep was representing her wishes and her wish to die and that she would never, ever want to live in a vegetative state. Her, fa her brother was a um, very religious uh, man who felt that Terry Schiavo absolutely uh, should live, must live, that the religion dictated that um, no one had a right to end her life, that she was in fact still alive and that she was in fact living. And so there was a hideous and ugly and very protracted um, legal battle as there have been a number of cases and Bill can talk a bit more about them. Um, and uh, finally she, uh, the courts did allow her to die. Um, we, we just had a much more recent case, as many of you know, a pregnant woman in Texas um, who was kept on life support after she was brain dead so that her, she, her baby could be incubated and though this baby would have been profoundly damaged, her husband, um, who knew her wishes, uh, those wishes were not honored because uh, Texas had the right to save the baby's life. So she was kept on life support until, again, a judge finally uh, was able to allow life support to be removed. Um, so there are many of these cases, and they're very tragic. They're most tragic when the family doesn't agree. We have about one minute left. Lee Hawkins, would you like to have the last word? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> All the words yet to come. We uh, would like to thank, first of all, we'd like to thank this incredible crowd that uh, showed up tonight. Very uh, enthusiastic support that we got here for this uh, forum that we put together, Laurie, myself, and, uh, and Denise and Bill. Um, I want to thank our panelists, uh, Ann Latham of West Hampton. Uh, thank you very much for coming tonight. Laurie Lazell, the Gazette's managing editor. Uh, Arthur Nell Lake, the book is The Caregivers, a support group story of slow loss, courage, and love. Uh, Dr. Joan Burzoff, the director of the End of Life Certificate Program at the Smith College School for Social Work in Bay State Medical Center. And of course, 90-year-old Lee Hawkins. <laughs> Thank you. And again, uh, Thank you all for coming. Uh, tomorrow morning between 8 and 10, we'll be broadcasting this entire program live on WHMP 96.9, 1400, 1600 AM. So, for Bill Newman, for our news director, Denise Vazella, for Bob Flaherty, myself, for uh, Laurie Lazell and Lee Hawkins and Ann Latham and Joan Burzoff and Nell Lake and our crowd of thousands here, <laughs> thanks for coming down here for a matter of life and death, a community forum from the Daily Hampshire Gazette. 
the uh, NCTV and WHMP. Thank you all for coming.